Hey guys, this is Ryan from Amonolith. So you're listening to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience. And welcome back to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience here in 90.3 WMSC up in Montclair. This is your host, Chris. And with me on the line, I have a very, very special guest. I have Ryan Van Puderian of a monolith. What's up, dude? How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man, and uh, great job on my last name. I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. I, like, like I said before, I, like uh, I've known you since the uh, Devin Townsend era. Like, I think that's like a decade now, and I always found your name kind of, you know, interesting. So I was like, I got to learn how to say that. <laughs> yeah, well, you did a good job. It's very Dutch, you know what I mean. So it's funny whenever I I tour over in Holland, um, they say it way better than I do. So. I always get people over there to say my last name for me. It's great to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so you guys are pretty busy right now on Monolith. You guys have been dropping singles. You've been uh, playing shows, you know, and you just finished up a brand new record, State of Being. It comes out March 27th. You now, we talked about this last year when you guys put out Hollow. Um, we talked a little bit about the recording process and stuff like that. And now it's all wrapped up and finished. So uh, how like relieved do you feel right now? You know what? It's been a long time coming. We we started the band in early 2018. So, you know, this album's basically taken a couple of years to make, right? And it, it is a big relief for us because we, we really took our time with it because we wanted it to be exactly the way we envisioned it. So we didn't want to rush the product out. We didn't want to rush the songwriting or anything like that. Uh, we worked with our producer very closely on it, and we just wanted to put out what we thought was the perfect record for our debut, and that's exactly what we did. We're super proud of it. Uh, I, I wouldn't even say that it's a relief. It's just we're very excited about it, and we're very happy that we took the time to put out the record that we want. And this, you said you worked with, uh, I think you said your brother, Jason Van Puderijn, correct? Yep, that's right. Yeah, and he he did a wonderful job. He he did the videos for Hollow and Extinct. Yeah, Jason he ended up uh, producing, engineering, mastering, mixing. He did like absolutely everything to this debut record, and uh, he's amazing to work with. He's worked with really big artists, which we talked about before. You know, with the likes of like Nickelback, Chris Cornell airborne he's doing the new simple plan record right now producing them so like he works with real big artists but um the thing is, is he always wanted to do a metal record so this was his chance with a monolith and he really dug the material he he thought it was really cool music and uh it gave him a chance to you know uh stretch his wings in, in this genre of music so uh we're we're absolutely stoked on what he did with the record and we can't wait for everyone to hear it that must be a nice little perk of being your brother and all that. You get to hear all that awesome material firsthand. <laughs> well, there's that, and you want to know something. Definitely. Right? So it's not just that he's my brother. That's that's a given that it's great to work with him. But, man, everyone in the band has learned so much through him because he's, he's a pro at what he does. He doesn't cut any corners. And that, I think, was the big theme for this record was – no corner cutting at all you know what i mean it's like let's take the time let's make this the way we want it and let's just give 110 percent in everything we do and that's something that jason does as well uh, last time we talked you were entering the studio i believe uh to like finish everything up how long did it take to like actually being in studio well put it this way we we entered the studio to do drum tracks in march of 2019 and by the time it was all finished, just the tracking part, I'd say it was kind of like end of July. So, like, we took a long time doing it. You know, it wasn't like we're in there for a month and we're out. It's like we revisited things, retracted some vocals or retracted a couple guitar solos or guitar parts. You know, the only thing we couldn't really retract were the drums, right? So we nailed those down. But, again, we took our time with it. And then after that, the mixing process, man, we we're mixing up until, geez, probably uh, I don't know, the end of summer, you know, and then uh, and then mastering was another thing. 
we had a couple uh couple different mastering sessions and you know by the time it was all mixed and mastered i'd say it was you know probably november so again uh you know took our time made sure it was right and we're very very happy with the results would you say that like because I, I know some bands complain about being in the studio. Like, when they have too much studio time, they start getting a little too nitpicky and too, like, uh, you know, because you heard it so many times, you start analyzing way too much. Do you think that ever happened to you guys? You know, I don't think it's the case with us. Um, it was more a case of we'd record everything, okay? We'd record it, all of our ideas, and our producer would sift through everything. And then sometimes he'd come back, he goes, this is what I'm thinking. And then maybe some members in the band would be like, oh, we were kind of thinking more like this. And then, you know, you, you hash it out with the producer, and that takes time. And that can change mixes. It can change a whole bunch of different things, right? So um, I don't think we really went down that rabbit hole, per se. But uh, I, I think we were just uh, taking our time very cautious with how we approach you know, mixing what parts made it in, what parts didn't. And if there wasn't something we were digging and we could record it, uh, re-record it, we would do that. So that happened with some of the vocals, that happened with some of the guitar parts and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, but for, for the most part, no. You know, we, we didn't go down that rabbit hole. It's very easy to do. But we're also a bunch of experienced musicians, right, through, you know, playing Devin Towns and Project. Kai played with Tommy Lee and Methods of Ma'am and, John with threat signal. So we all have a lot of experience. And I think from all that experience, we realize that, Hey, let's not go down that road. You know, <laughs> I can get pretty ugly once you open up that can of worms. No, I definitely, I definitely get that. I totally get that. Um, did you, cause you guys like probably work a lot and like, this has been an album. I mean, for the past year, you guys have been writing stuff even before that. Did you got, did you have like a lot of leftover tracks, like tracks that you didn't use that you might release as a B B single or something like that? You know what? Interestingly enough, no. Um, With our producer, what we did is we gave him like, I don't know, it was like 16 or 18 songs or something. He went through them all and with us, and then he said, this is the ideal record that I would like to record. Um, The other thing that you have to keep in mind is uh, Jason's time. He's an extremely busy guy. And, uh, you know, he basically only had enough time to do the amount of songs that we did on this record. So we were very careful with the songs we chose. So we ended up recording exactly what's on the the album. There are really no B sides. We have all the demos, but uh, we didn't record any more songs. We were just very focused on recording the songs that we chose, went in there, nailed them and uh, gave 110% on mixing and mastering them and, and giving them all the attention they needed. You also have like a very special uh, guest appearance on this record. You have uh, Jen Kidman of Mashuga, and you have Swedish vocalist Johans Eckerstrom. Uh, how'd yeah. you like? How how did that happen? How'd you reach out to them to get them on the record? Well, both those guys are really good friends. Okay, so like I've known Mashuga guys for quite a while from touring with Devin Townsend, and uh, you know. Jens and I, we keep in touch. We'll FaceTime each other. You know, we see each other at NAM and we'll hang for the whole weekend kind of thing. And uh, I've always been uh, a fan of his voice. I've always loved Meshuga. And uh, I just thought, how awesome would it be to have Jens guest on, you know, the heaviest track on the record? And uh, so, you know, I just gave him a call one day. I'm like, hey, man, would love to have you guest on it. Uh, entirely up to you understand if you pass or whatever but he checked out the song he said yeah man i'd love to i'll I'll give it a shot hand you my vocals if you like them use them (laughs) and that was that right and uh of course we got the vocals and we're floored it just it sounds amazing you know and jason did a great job of mixing them in with john and same thing with johannes johannes is one talented dude and um you know i just called him up and i said same thing you know love your voice we think your voice and would match really good with john's we'd love to have you guests on this song same thing checked out the song and said let's do it man i'd love to and laid down a killer vocal track and that's how it all came together you know it's a it's a pretty easy process and it helps too when they're friends right um 
But I think one of the key points why we chose those two specific vocalists is because their voices meshed really well with John's voice. And that was important. You just don't want, you know, some guy's voice coming in there and, and not meshing or vibing with the song at all. So we were very careful with uh, who we chose because we, we know a lot of people in the industry, right? But uh, those two guys specifically worked for the songs we had in mind, and they also worked with John's voice as well. That's so cool. Like you said, like you picked him for the heaviest track because in my mind, I was like, his voice is so iconic for being in one of the heaviest bands there are, you know, and having him on the yeah. heaviest track would just make sense. But to me, I I know that uh, last time we talked, you kept talking about Dig, and I think you guys posted like a nice little preview of it online, and that's one I've been wanting to hear for a while. So my question is, why did you guys pick Instinct instead of Dig as the next single? Well, it's, it's funny you're asking that question because first I'll get this out of the way. Dig is coming out this Friday. We're releasing it this Friday. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I won't say any more. You have to tune in. Go to and, uh or follow us on our, any of our social media pages. It'll be plastered all over that stuff come Friday. So, And I'm stoked. Like, collectively, I think that's one of the band's favorite songs to, you know, to listen to and, and definitely to play live, right? So this Friday, you'll, you'll hear that. But as far as choosing instinct um, over dig, it's, it's very difficult because, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of other songs we'd love to release as well, right? But instinct, I think, was a step up from hollow because hollow was, um, you know, fairly, uh, I wouldn't say commercial, but it, it's definitely... Uh, it would apply to a, a larger fan base, right? Whereas Instinct is definitely a lot heavier, and but it still has that catchy chorus. Um, so that's a cool thing about it. And it kind of was a step in a different direction from Hollow. Now, we're releasing Dig this Friday, which is a completely different step uh, than both Hollow and Instinct, right? So we're trying to show that we're just not one style. You know, it's like, we're, we're a metal band for sure, but we like to, uh, to show different flavors in our music. So that's why we chose Instinct. Um, that's why we chose Dig as our next one. You know, it's like uh, we just want to show the different uh, ways we're approaching our music. Oh, I definitely agree that you guys do have a wide range of music. Just based off of hearing, uh, you know, your first single, Hollow, hearing Instinct, just hearing, like, clips of Dig. And uh, then, again, mentioning that you had um, Jens Kidman on Meshuggah, I was like, what's going on here? You know, I feel like this is great um, anticipation leading to the record. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a record that we wanted to make. I'll, I'll go back to saying that. It's like we just didn't want it to be all crushing, crushingly heavy. We didn't uh, want it to be all catchy. We just focused on writing the best songs that we could. Just we didn't want to reinvent the wheel of music and go. This is this is the new sound. You know, it's like when grunge came out or something like that. We, we aren't looking to change anything like that. We just want to take from our influences. We want to write what we feel, and we want to write the absolute best songs we can. And that was our focus with this record. And um, we're really really happy with the results. And uh, you know, we're hoping that everyone who hears it thinks the same. Now, I know you guys uh, already had everything done, but was there any wrenches thrown into uh, the whole process when Jed and um, Byron Stroud left the band? Um, well, it's it, not, no, not really at all. Like, um, with Jed, he was in the band very briefly. Like, that, that didn't, that, that was a, a hot minute, right? And uh, it, it was simple with Jed, it was just, totally different styles of writing and and how we were approaching the music no hard feelings whatsoever right it's like for either side jed's a brother right so we we're just like hey man it's not working from our side and wasn't working from his side either so it was a very mutual thing we we're just like cool no problem and we just went on right that that was a very quick thing with byron he was in the band obviously a lot longer than jed but byron just couldn't commit to our album cycle and all the touring and stuff we were going to do for personal and family reasons. So, um, you know, we fully understood that, you know, there, there was no problem. Again, 
Byron's a bro as well, right? And but that's just the way it worked out. He he dug the music and, and was having a great time with it. But you know, once we presented the plans and and how long we plan on going out on tour and and all that was you know included in doing this, uh, he was straight up and honest with us and just saying there's there's no way I can commit to that, unfortunately. And we're glad he did that because there'd be nothing worse than you about to go on tour and then <laughs> your bass player comes up and says, "Hey man, I can't tour." That would have been horrible. So, you know, uh, he, he told us, like, last June that uh, that he wasn't going to be able to commit. So he's been out of the band for a while now. But um, we understood that, and we thought it was best definitely to, to part ways in that sense. So, again, Jed and Byron, awesome guys. Uh, they're brothers, and uh, it just wasn't in the cards, you know. So right now we got Scott Whalen and, and Kai Hoopin in. Uh, filling in the spots, they rounded out the band perfectly, and we got an amazing band here. And this is this is the band moving forward, ready to to go out there and you know just tour our butts off and and make this happen. Well, it's good that you guys are still friends. Like you said, you all great dudes, and you guys are like brothers. So like maybe something down the line, maybe a couple years later, you guys can release something like a little side project, like an EP or something together. Well, that's it. Like that's the thing is, it wasn't anything bad. You know, like I said, with Jed, it was just a, a matter of uh, completely different styles of writing. You know what I mean? Which totally makes sense. We we just wanted to, to to get a bunch of people who are bros and and good friends in the band. You know, but sometimes that doesn't always work out when it comes to the writing part. And then with Byron again, just the uh, you know his personal family reasons. So, man, family first. You know what I mean? Yeah. We all supported his decision. You know, is is great. So yeah, you know, there's definitely no hard feelings whatsoever. It's just like uh, different different things happening in different people's lives. Uh, I know. Last time we talked about the benefits of releasing this album on your own. You guys are doing this through like your own your own ways because you made so many connections being in other bands and Devin Townsend Project and all that. But you said if there was ever a time where like a, a label gave you like a an unreal deal, you would probably consider it has labels talked to you guys at all have they reached out no at this point like we did all of our label talking when we were demoing this stuff before we went in to record it um no labels have reached out yet i think if any label were to reach out to us it'll be after the album's released and we're doing stuff with it especially if things start to take off or if we start you know, blowing up or, or whatever the case may be, if there's a, a lot of positive uh, reaction to it. Yeah, you know, maybe labels will come. Maybe they won't because they know we're we're releasing this through our own record label. But yeah, you know, it's like, um, it, it'll be interesting to see. Regardless, we're super excited about um, how we're releasing it, how it's all coming together. Uh, you know, we're able to release it just like a label. You know, it's like even our digital distributions being done to the orchard, you know, so which is worldwide and they're pretty much the best at digital distribution. So we got a lot of awesome things happening for us. We got an amazing team of people, uh, you know, from management to PR to radio people, everything. We, we got a great team set up with us. So it's pretty exciting to do it this way because you own it all. It's you. You know, it's a monolith music. That's our record label, right? So, um, you know, whether labels come at us or not, I, I don't think we're too concerned about that because we're right now we're really focused on trying to make it happen independently for this album. And you know what? If we can do it for the future for all of our albums, I think that would be the best way possible. But, you know, let's flip flip the side of the coin there. And if a label does come up and they, they throw a bunch of money at you because you're, you're becoming successful with what you're doing, obviously you're going to look at every option, you know, but right now, as it stands, it's all about a monolith music, the label we set up and uh, everything's going awesome. Everything's going to plan. And it's a pretty exciting time for us. I was going to say, you're definitely going to hear after putting out this album, you're definitely going to hear something from labels. <laughs> it's definitely going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it remains to be seen. You know, it's like, again, you know, we're, we're, we're not counting on it. We're, we're not hoping for it. We're not anything. We're just, let's release it. Let's see how this thing goes, and uh, we'll take it from there. You know, it's like, I think the best thing you can do is be open-minded. That's the best thing you can possibly do, is just look at all your options no matter what. 
you know, and then just make a very educated decision and move forward. For anyone tuning in right now, you're listening to 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair, the Metal Teddy Bear Experience, and I'm joined here with Ryan Van Puderian of a Monolith. So if you remember on my show, I asked three random silly questions. Are you ready for this? Oh, yeah. yeah it's hit me with them, man. Let's do it. <laughs> Round two. Here we go. Uh, don't worry. I won't ask you about button your shirt anymore. <laughs> ah. So uh, question <laughs> uh, number one for you. Now, this is all about zombie apocalypse. So if there was a zombie oh, wow. apocalypse that happened, uh, it's a two-parter right now. So if there's a zombie apocalypse, where would you hide and what celebrities would you recruit for your zombie apocalypse team? All right. Where would I hide? I don't know. I, I, I'd try and find my way down to Cabo because I love it down there. So somewhere nice and hot and warm and, you know, I can, can deal with that. Who would I take with me? Uh, probably some of my favorite, like, MMA stars. You know, I, I grabbed George St. Pierre, of course. Uh, you know, grabbed Chuck Liddell, why not? You know, I know The Rock isn't uh, is an MMA, but hey, pretty big dude, right? Looks like a fun hang. So th- there you go. There's, there's some uh, examples of who I'd like to take with me. It'd be pretty fun. <laughs> you know, whacking off some, get, killing some zombies and stuff, you know? Uh, I definitely agree with that. I mean, maybe The Rock would be, uh, take up too much room. I think he'd be uh, making too much noise. He, he's, uh, what's he, 6'4 or something like that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's a big dude. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, and where would you say you would hide again? Pardon me? Uh, where would you guys hide? Like, what would you? Where would you go? Oh, I, I just I brought up Lost Cabos. It's one of my favorite places to vacation, right? But are you talking like an actual, like, like would you hide in an apartment building, or is that is that what your question was? Is there, you know, like if that's the case, um, oh man, well you know what? Uh, I'd hide in a gun shop. <laughs> with all the ammo and guns I could find. <laughs> That's solid. Like, to me, like, I'll take a page out of the Walking Dead's book. Like, they uh, they got a prison. Unfortunately, a guy with a tank uh, ran him out of town. But I thought prison was pretty good because it's fortified and, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of places to sleep and all that stuff. And But a gun store is actually just as good. Yeah, no, the, the prison, I love the prison episodes. As a huge fan of Walking Dead, I kind of lost touch the last few seasons, though. Yeah, right. Me too. I I kind of fell out of it. I I didn't realize I uh I didn't realize I actually came back to be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh question number 2, what's the weirdest experience while on public transportation? Um well, this was uh pretty crazy. There was this guy uh he was on the other side of the bus, mind you. And I saw this girl flipping out him, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? But, uh, yeah, you know, the guy was, uh, I guess, checking her out and masturbating. So, <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, yeah, I can understand why she's yelling at him. Because I got up, I was like, hey, is everything cool? And then I saw what Buddy was doing. I'm just like, wow, okay, you need to come over here and get off the train. You know, it's like, but, yeah, I saw that happen. It's kind of crazy. I was years and years and years ago. It was probably like 15, 15 20 years ago. Was but that yeah, in, it's pretty crazy. Was that in uh, where you live, or is that by, uh, like, you know, New York or something like that? No, that that was here in Vancouver. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty, pretty weird. And I don't think uh, there's anything weirder that's happening on transportation than that. Yeah, the, the only, uh, the one I, like, I usually think of when I ask this question, I have it, like, uh, we went to one of the the like we went in the subway, went in the one of the carts, and uh, we wondered why no one was in there. Absolutely no one was in that cart. Right? All right, cool. We have places to sit. And after being in there for like almost thirty seconds, we just smelt the stench of something. And we're like, oh my oh. god! It was a, a homeless guy. Just you know, he went everywhere. He went to the bathroom all over that that cart. So we, oh, we immediately, wow. yeah, we ran out of there as fast as we could. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that sounds pretty nasty. Oh, yeah. And uh, final question for the random silly question segment. What's your biggest pet peeve while on tour? Oh, man. I love being on tour. But uh, biggest pet peeve, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. It'd probably be the uh, the early uh, bus calls. You know, it's like, 
I, I love hanging out after the show because we've toured around the world so many times with Devin Townsend Project that you, you make a lot of friends, right? And this story, I'm not a, uh, providing a more, uh, more exciting answer, but to, to be honest, I love seeing all my buddies, you know, when I go city to city. And when they're like, okay, you're off stage, grab a shower, we're out. You know, it's like, ah, oh, man. You know, so that stuff kind of bothers me. Uh, what's the other thing? Uh, I don't know. Oh, showers. Showers. If there's no showers at venues, it's the worst. You know, not, not being able to shower for like three days and four days in a row because uh, venues didn't have it or whatever. And if you're on a bus, buses don't have showers. Well, some do, but not the buses we were on. And, uh, yeah, man, if there's no showers at the venues and, and you get off stage and you're sweating for, you know, a couple hours playing the show and then you got to go travel and sleep in your bunk all, all sweaty and stuff like that, it's gross. So, Pepe, definitely not having showers at venues because I love to grab a shower after the show. You know, chill out, relax, go sleep in a clean bed. <laughs> yeah, someone showers every day, that definitely would uh, bother me on tour. I also heard, like, there was a band that put out, like, band tips while on tour, and one of them was uh, join a membership that's nationwide where they have, like, 24-hour uh, facilities, so wherever you are, you can find one and shower there for free because it's definitely worth it. But like you said, most venues oh, usually have it, right? Yeah, well, you know what? It's going to be interesting because the Monolith is going on our first major tour ever, and that's headlining the U.K. and Europe, and that starts on march 27th to april 27th and um a lot of the venues we're playing are obviously going to be a lot smaller than what we did with devon townsend project because we're brand new bands so not sure my biggest pet peeves probably about to happen a lot <laughs> because uh we're going to be playing smaller venues so with those venues you're not always guaranteed to have showers so i'm not sure how many uh showers we're going to have you know, as far as uh, venues are concerned, but we are getting accommodations like a hotel room or whatever. So when the shower, if there is no shower in the venue, we'll just before bus call, we'll just uh, we'll head over to the hotel room, grab our showers, and get the heck out of there. So uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. Well, that concludes the random silly question segment. I hope you enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun for me. No, oh, of course. You know, it puts you on the spot, so you got to... But the thing is, you got to be honest. That's the best thing. Yeah. It's like, you start making stuff up, it just backfires. So, <laughs> there's my honest answers. Some of them are hilarious, some are cool, you know, some are boring. But, hey, that's, that's life on the road, man. I'm so curious about your uh, random tour stories, because last time you said they were in a... You couldn't really share them on air, so I'm really... I'm still looking forward to those. But um, you guys are coming around soon, right, after your uh, European tour, right? You're doing a East Coast tour, or no? Yeah, so here's the plan. Um, do this European UK tour, and then we'd love to hit North America. Now, we can do North America all as one. Uh, an, an option that we've been looking at is do all of Canada and then do the United States, just because Canada is our, our home country, right? So um, there's a bunch of options that our booking agent's looking at right now. So I'll tell you this much, though. The, the next place we're going to tour is North America. Uh, how and where, we don't know yet, but we're working on that, and we'd love to, to be touring by the summertime. Okay. So, you know, get, get home from uh, this UK, European tour, and then, you know, a couple months later, uh, be in the States or Canada or, or both. Well, you're breaking out the, the uh, UK tour, like you said, on March 27th. That's the release date for uh you know your brand new album state of being so you guys is that like your release party in a way yeah kind of you know it's like we said hey let's uh let's try and get a gig on the day the album comes out so it's in sheffield i believe and uh yeah so that'll be kind of like a, a cd release we haven't really promoted it that way it's just the tour happens to start on that day so that's going to be a cool gig man you know it's like album comes out and you know first shows in uh sheffield uk and uh on the day the album comes out so it's going to be an awesome time oh definitely dude and um again i can't wait for you guys to come by here hopefully you come by the uh, new york new jersey area we'd be uh, honored to see you and uh, i can't wait for dig on friday that's uh thank you for dropping that i really appreciate that i'm pumped <laughs> 
Yeah, no, digs coming out Friday. It'll be uh, it'll be out everywhere, and uh, people have pre-ordered the album. Uh, you know that digital version of that song will be available for them right away on Friday as well, so they can just check that out right away. And, it, and um, yeah, you know, uh, one thing I'll mention as well, uh, amonolithfan.com. That's a, a great place to go. If you want to pre-order the album, that's the place you want to go. Go uh, there, and we have these awesome uh, pre-order bundles. You can actually customize your own bundle, and you can get a vinyl, signed, not signed, CD signed, not signed. If you buy the CD or the vinyl, you get a free um, digital download of the album as well. Uh, you can choose shirts. You can choose, you know, like uh, hoodies, a whole bunch of different types of merch, and bundle your own uh, pre-order pack. So it's going really good. People are really digging that option. And again, go to monolithband.com, and uh, you can pre-order our album, which comes out March 27th. And uh, yeah, we're pretty stoked, man. And definitely, we'll be touring uh, New York, New Jersey area. There's no question. You'd be crazy not to hit that if you go to the states. So it'll be uh, be awesome to meet you in person, man. And get you out to the show. Definitely, dude. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, I really appreciate it, everyone. State of Being, March 27th. Check it out. Um, thank you so much, Ryan. Have a great night. Thank you very much for the interview. Appreciate it, brother. Have a great night. Yeah.